Good morning, welcome in Jesus' name. If you are joining us through our streaming services this morning, we would remind you that for following along in the uh, in this service, it would be better to uh, first download our service bulletin for this morning, which has the order of service in it. You may find the link um, along with the streaming um, information. This morning in our service, we are focusing on discipleship and what it means to be true followers of Jesus. For in him, we have life and salvation. Let us pray. O Lord, our maker, redeemer, and comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. Open our hearts by your Holy Spirit that through the preaching of your word we may be brought to repent of our sins, believe on Jesus in life and in death, and grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We sing hymn number 234, Holy Ghost with Light Divine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions but we are sorry for our transgressions and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake, renew us by your Spirit, and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. We are forgiven. With boldness and confidence, we may approach the throne to find grace to help in time of need. In the peace of forgiveness, 
Let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, because your abiding presence always goes with us, keep us aware of your daily mercies, that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In our Old Testament lesson, already Jeremiah encountered those who, in the name of the Lord, would present a message that they thought the people wanted to hear rather than the message that God had given them. True discipleship is to follow Jesus' word, to follow God's truth and present it faithfully, as Jeremiah did. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is found recorded in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, where we read in the 28th chapter, beginning with the 5th verse. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, the Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who were carried away captive from Babylon to this place. Nevertheless, hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Our second lesson this morning, our epistle lesson, speaks to the issue of discipleship regarding our attitude towards sin. You know, the gospel doesn't give us license to sin. And even though we are told that the grace of God is greater than much sin. It isn't so that we can go out and abound in sinfulness, but rather the gospel shows us the way of Christ, that even as he died for us, so we died with him, died to sin, that we might live for righteousness. Our, gospel, our, our epistle lesson this morning is found recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, where we begin reading in the first, in the sixth chapter, the first verse. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. 
Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends our epistle. Let us rise and confess our faith with the whole Christian church on earth. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with hymn number 421, Come Follow Me.
grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon meditation this morning is found recorded in Matthew's Gospel. We read in the 10th chapter beginning with the 34th verse. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall no, by no means lose his reward. This is the word of God. Sanctify us, O Lord, through your truth. Your word is true. Amen. In Christ Jesus, God, our Savior, dear fellow redeemed, false expectations abound. And whether we like to admit it or not, we all fall victim to false expectations. We like to hear what we want to hear. Promises are made that no one intends to keep. They come to us and scam emails or in the shape of a phony stock investment or some kind of a real estate gimmick or all you have to do is trust me. Just give me a little bit of your personal information and you will be the recipient of riches beyond belief. You see, scam artists know that there's a little bit of greed in everyone. Enough that it will tip the scales for at least a few people. But then, we have all been forewarned and prepared for scam artists that make those promises that are too good to be true, aren't we? And yet they keep on calling. And because they say what people want to hear. Many people, even smart people, fall victim to those promises which they cannot keep, which they don't even bother to try to keep. It doesn't bother them. All one has to do is lead people down the path of false expectations. And there's a flip side to that, isn't there? Because when you listen to the scam, you're also rejecting real expectations and what it takes to get ahead in life. And even more people fall victim to that because of the preponderance of get-rich schemes, including state-run lotteries. And people reject sound savings and investment plans as being only for chumps. They even have radio spots to encourage regular savings and realistic long-term expectations for preparing for one's retirement or later life. But no one would do these kind of things with our religion, with faith, would they? Well, they would. They have. They do. False teachers proclaim false expectations on just about every level within the realm of religion and even under the name of Christianity. They say what they know people want to hear. 
anything and everything, from get rich schemes, if you send your money into this or that TV evangelist, to social justice and peace and harmony among the nations of the world, to possessing peace with God, apart from repentance, so that one may do both, please the world in one sinful flesh, while also pleasing God, simply by being nice. You know, Jesus' own disciples suffered from these very same false expectations within Jewish society. You see, one religious party in the Jewish society, the Sadducees, pushed a, a message of world peace and, and Jewish prosperity. The other, the Pharisees, pushed a message of peace with God through a good works agenda. And there were still others that were promoting the pleasures of this world as being the way to live. And all those messages appealed to the flesh. And they confused even Jesus' disciples. Throughout Jesus' ministry, it was necessary for him to address the matter of expectations of discipleship. Jesus began by presenting an expectation of a sword. A sword! For us to be true disciples of Jesus, we, rem we need to remember that our faith and life are built upon the sacrifice that Jesus made. And of course, that focuses our attention upon his cross. But we need, need to remember that Jesus endured much abuse and hatred long before he went to the cross. And he spoke plainly of the fact that the disciple is not above his master. He told them if the world hated Jesus, and it did, and it still does, then it will also hate his true and faithful disciples. Well, what's the hate about Jesus? To begin with, people didn't like it that Jesus called out sin and hypocrisy. He told them that sin brings death, that sin separates the soul from God, both here in time and, and hereafter in eternity. Jesus called for repentance, true repentance that turns away from sin, that rejects sin, you know, we ought to be repulsed by our own sinful lust and confess a total reliance upon the merit of Jesus for forgiveness and life. And yes, of course, we know and believe that Jesus went to the cross to suffer for our sins, and that was the greatest of all sacrifices made for us, made for our salvation. But the world rejects all this. The world has embraced as good and wholesome many gross sins. They declare there's no need for repentance. Abortion is a woman's right to choose. It's not the killing of a baby. It's not a baby. It's a mass of cells. Sins of moral turpitude are declared a protected right so that people might be true to themselves. And so many sins are celebrated with parades and actually special months, months of recognition. Any dissension is now considered hate speech, and it must be silenced. Calls for repentance, they bring out the sword a sword of vehemence against the child of God. The Lord's calls for repentance are declared bigoted. The world has decided there is no sin, there is no sin for which anyone needs to repent other than failing to embrace the sins of others. 
You must tolerate them. Tolerance. That's the sword that we should expect. But the sword is also drawn against the gospel, not just against the condemnation of sin. We know and believe that it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he has saved us. The world rejects that idea that, that people cannot secure a righteousness that pleases God by their own merits and conduct. The world despises the idea of repentance saying there is peace with God because God is love. And of course, God is love. However, God is also just. And sin must be addressed in a just and fair manner. And God did this in Christ Jesus. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So God presents us with righteousness that avails before him this is where we come to the expectation of, of discipleship, also including sacrifice. Jesus is telling us that the gift of peace that God brings to us through this wondrous grace of the gospel does not always bring peace with other people in our lives. Most certainly the peace of God that comes to us through the gospel does not bring peace with the world. Instead of peace, that message brings a sword. We will experience the sword of the world's hatred in the form of, of protest to the truth of God's word and ridicule and anger and rejection. Now, a recent Supreme Court ruling, just a couple weeks ago, went against a Christian seminary for expelling students who were living in open homosexuality, even though the, seminaries, the seminary acted in accordance with their Christian faith. Realistic expectation is that the world will turn against the truth and those who hold to the truth. Even close family ties will be challenged when family members choose to compromise God's word, choose the ways of the world over the truth of God's word. Jesus reminded the disciples, and so also us, that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. That's real sacrifice, isn't it? It cuts to the heart. And it's to be expected. And it needs to be faced with a clear testimony. When family, loved ones, conform to the world and are true to the world, we need to be true to Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. And Jesus made it clear that we will be called upon to make sacrifices for Jesus that involve family ties. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. To try to please the world or make room an allowance for the sins of the world while claiming to be true to Jesus, well, that's falling for the world scam. If you seek to preserve this life, to preserve those pleasures of the flesh that appeal to us, 
Well, unless you repent, it will cost you your spiritual and eternal life. If, as disciples of Jesus, we accept sacrifice in this temporal life, take up our cross, knowing that there's areas where we will be disappointed for a time, but then Jesus in his grace and power will preserve our eternal lives. And yes, of course, this will impact us in every area of life. Our family ties, our social lives, our, our professional lives. But the Lord knows and the Lord blesses. He more than compensates any sacrifice that we may experience with the true peace that comes to those who know the love of Christ. And as disciples, we also live in the expectation of, of, of fulfillment, of life fulfillment by serving, serving the Lord. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. Remember that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We are followers of Jesus who served us and gave himself for us. He also continues to serve us as he sits at the right hand of God, making intercession for us before the throne of God, pleading for forgiveness for us every day, and he there is providing for our daily needs, for body and life. Jesus serves us richly every day, and for that we praise his glorious name. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. And so the Lord presents us with the opportunities to respond to his kindness by serving our neighbor. This begins with serving others with the gospel, by sharing with those whom the Lord has placed close to us that which, which fills our hearts with joy and peace. So when we have opportunity to speak to friends or, or relatives or, or even acquaintances of the hope that fills our hearts, that's a special privilege. We serve others, realizing that when we serve them with the gospel of Christ, we give them the best we have to give. Those who hear and gladly receive us are in fact receiving Jesus. Those who spurn the gospel, they're not rejecting us, but him who sent us. At the same time, we have opportunity to do good to those who preach the gospel as well as those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus said, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assure, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. We ought to realize that loving kindness and serving others is something the Lord looks for in our lives, in the lives of all his disciples. And he receives such works of praise and glory as offerings of thanksgiving to him. It will be remembered as the Lord, according to his grace, receives us into our heavenly home, the little things, those little things that we may do in life, they mean a lot. Well, both to the people who are receiving them and to the Lord in heaven above. A word of kindness, a visit, a phone call, expressing our concern for another, that can cheer the heart of a fellow Christian. Note in our text how Jesus uses the example of simply giving a little child a glass of water. To do that in the name of a disciple, meaning to do that as a follower of Jesus, well, one will not lose their reward. Jesus notes that. Think of 
how we take for granted among us those, those little things in life and yet to share them with others. You know, especially now in this, this time of the pandemic, we have been reminded that not only in America, but our brothers and sisters in other countries are struggling. Our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in India or various countries in Africa or Myanmar or Pakistan, some are in dire need. And so we have responded as followers of Christ, as disciples who rejoice in all the blessings that the Lord has showered upon us, both spiritual and material. Well, we rejoiced in the opportunity to serve others, to present them with a glass of water. And we do it in his name. He grants us the privilege of being the vehicle through which he blesses them in their time of need. We're talking about expectations and how easy it is to be deceived by the false expectations presented by the deceivers of this world. Now, we should not think that we need to lower our expectations as disciples of Christ. That's not what this is about, is it? In fact, it's just the opposite. We have to raise our expectations above this world. We live with the greatest of expectations, expectations that have their foundation in the cross of Christ. It is this cross of Christ that shapes our expectations of discipleship so that we follow where our Savior leads. We rejoice in the meaning and purpose this discipleship brings to our otherwise transitory and mundane lives. We rejoice in the great expectations that are ours as we serve the Lord and our neighbor with gladness all the days of this earthly pilgrimage. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we pray. Almighty and most merciful God, we implore you to hide the shame of our transgressions from your sight. Clothe us in the garments of salvation purchased by the suffering and death of your Son on the cross, those robes of righteousness which have been washed clean in his blood. Continue to bless your church, the fellowship of believers. May your ministers always proclaim the untainted message of salvation and let your people joyfully hear and believe it. Stir up all Christendom with your Holy Spirit, turning the hearts of people everywhere to faithful worship and Christ-directed living. We entreat you to give understanding, moral strength, and courage to the President and Congress of the United States, to the Governor and Legislature of this state, and to all who have authority over us. Instill into the hearts of journalists, authors, educators, and others molders of public opinion a deep respect for you. Show them how to use the talents you have given them to promote justice, moral decency, proper values, and good order in this land. We pray for people who are in difficulties, for poor and needy, for the sick and aged, for the desolate and downtrodden, and for all who are lonely and despairing. Be gracious to them and bless them. Arouse your church on earth to greater compassion for all who are afflicted. Grant wisdom to all who teach the children and youth of our congregations. May Christ dwell richly in the hearts of our parents and children, that our Christian homes stand as enduring models of godliness in an ungodly world. Teach Christians everywhere to be moderate in all things. Give them the trust to commit their ways to you 
and the sanctified will to flee temptation, lust, and all conduct unbecoming to Christians. Help us set an example for others in our community by godly living, by brotherly harmony, by Christian charity, and by love for your word and for this house of worship. May our speech and our conduct ever mirror the imminence of the great and glorious day of Christ's coming. Keep our hearts and souls strong through your word and sacraments so that the sound of the last trumpet will be a note of joy and gladness for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And we also join in praying in Jesus' name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, at this time in the service in which we normally receive our offering, I remind you that our offerings will be received by placing them in the plate um, that is in the doorway between the, the nave and the narthex. And those who are joining us from home may uh, give their offerings to the Lord by either dropping them off here at the church where they'll be kept in a secure place or by mailing them to the church. We continue our service by singing hymn number 408. <laughs> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We close with hymn number 409, verse 1. Bye. 
A reminder that um, we will have worship again next Sunday at our regular time. Next Sunday's worship will also be a communion service. And um, you may register for communion either by telling the pastor personally, will not be putting out a list with a pen, um, or sending me a text message to my, to my cell phone. Um, either, either you can do that registration either today during the week or before the service next Sunday. Um, are there any other announcements that should be made at this time? There is a thing about that the ladies and she was on the Lord. Oh, there is a there is a a ladies retreat is going to be is is scheduled for um, a later date in Nebraska, and that information is on the bulletin board by the mailboxes um, in the narthex. The peace of the Lord be with you all. <laughs>